to T Chancellor Johnson, Dr. Mary Benjamin, our panelists, and all of you. Good morning and welcome to the National HBCU Week Assembly. My name is Molly Stone. I'm currently a junior here at the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff, and I'm majoring in English education. We will begin our program with the invocation by Ms. Carlin Freeman, followed by greetings from Rolanda Watley, Miss University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. To Chancellor Johnson in his absence, Dr. Benjamin, administrators, and all of my Golden Lion family that have gathered here to celebrate an institute of change in the African American community. Someone once told me, the blacker the college, the sweeter the knowledge. Well, I greet you from the sweetest historically black college and university in all the land. Sweet is our rich history as our inter institute has enriched so many people's lives. Sweet is our knowledge as this university has given the priceless gift of education to so many. So today, I welcome you to the sweet flagship of the Delta, the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, our historically black college and university. We will now have a proclamation by Dr. Mary E. Benjamin, Vice Chancellor, Chancellor of Academic Affairs, and a spoken word by Mr. Justin Smith. To the presiding officer, to all assembled, and especially to the committee that planned this program, I want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for being sure that we take time at our university to honor and celebrate historically black colleges and universities. I think it also is appropriate that we recognize our president who has proclaimed HBCU Week. So we will do a round of applause whether we can accept it or not. And now, as you know, our president is very eloquent and he has drafted a proclamation which I am going to read to you. And I would ask that you would listen very carefully to the terminology because it is very well thought out. This is the proclamation. More than 150 years ago, courageous men and women took great risks and made extraordinary sacrifices to establish our country's first African-American colleges and universities. These institutions remain at the forefront of providing educational opportunities to young people across our country today. During National Historically Black Colleges and University Week, we pay homage to the daring leaders who laid the foundation for these institutions, and we reaffirm our commitment to ensuring historically black colleges and universities remain pathways to realizing the American dream. Founded by visionaries, HBCUs have given generations of students a sense of their heritage, their history, and their place in the American narrative. They have produced many of our nation's leaders in business, government, academia, and the military. Today, we recognize them as the crucibles of learning, where a young legal student discovered the sense of purpose that led him to the Supreme Court. A young broadcaster with a unique name gained the foundation to build an empire. And a young preacher grew into a king who shared his dream with the world. HBCUs continue a proud tradition as vibrant centers of intellectual inquiry and engines of scientific discovery and innovation. New waves of students, faculty, and alumni are building on their rich legacies and helping America achieve our goal of once again leading the world and having the highest proportion of college graduates by 2020. This week, as we celebrate the vast contributions HBCUs have made to our nation, we are reminded of their role in fulfilling a great American truth. 
that equal access to a quality education can open doors for all our people. By continuing to strengthen HBCUs, we ensure they remain beacons of hope for future generations of Americans who will move our country closer to the ideals of our founding. Now, therefore, I, Barack Obama, President of the United States of America, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution and the laws of the United States, do hereby be proclaim September 18th through September 25th, 2012, as National Historically Black Colleges and Universities Week. I call upon educators, public officials, professional organizations, corporations, and all the people of the United States to observe this week with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities that acknowledge the numerous contributions these institutions and their alumni have made to our country. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand this 18th day of September in the year of our Lord, 2012, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 236. This is by our president, Barack Obama. Unfortunately, Mr. Justin Smith was not able to um, be with us today, so now we will transition to panel discussion, remaining relevant for the next generation, moderated by Ms. Tisha Arnold. To all of you, to Dr. Mary Benjamin, to Chancellor Johnson in his absence, to the radio family that is listening in on this program. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Johnson, I'm sorry, <laughs> he is here. To all of you that are listening live on KUAP 89.7, we'll start our panel discussion and the topic for this uh, morning is remaining relevant for the next generation. At this time, we'll ask our local panelists to go ahead and take the table. Joining us remotely, we have Dr. William Harvey, who is the Dean of the School of Education at the North Carolina A&T University. And the reason we brought him in, he uh, made a presentation at our recent alumni conference. And the, the information was so very moving and informative on what we need to do to make sure that we're relevant for this next generation for you and those that come after you to make sure that we can remain viable um, in this academe. So at this point, we will start with our uh, introductions. Each panelist will give about a minute to introduce themselves and give kind of an opening statement, and then we'll move on with our questions. We'll start with Dr. Harvey, if he is, are we off mute? All right. Good morning, Dr. Harvey. Okay, we're now? We're live. We can hear you. And see me as well? Yes, sir. Good, are everybody doing well? Doing well, thank you. All right, go ahead and introduce yourself and give us your opening statement. I'm sorry, we're having a little bit of trouble with the volume, so I just need to All right. come up a little bit so I can hear what you're saying. Okay. Let me know when you're ready. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry, did you ask me to make a brief statement as I got in? Yes. Introduce yourself okay. and then give us your, your opening statement. Thank you. That's fine. My name is Bill Harvey. I'm Dean of the School of Education at North Carolina A&T State University and have a I, I appreciate having the opportunity to uh, address you on this very important topic. I think one of the reasons I was asked to speak with you today was that I addressed a group of uh, university alumni, University of Arkansas Pine Local alumni, uh, about a month or so ago uh, at a function in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it was about the same topic, the, the, the issue of the future of HBCUs, the considerations about where we stand at this moment and where we'll be going in the future. It's a very important one, certainly for all of us who are in the educational arena. Very important one, obviously, for those of you students at this institution, these institutions. So um, let me just, in a nutshell, uh, in terms of summary, say that these are incredibly important institutions. We need to understand the value that they have served historically, but we also have to address the contemporary issues and challenges that they face. That means change. We must innovate, we must find ways to make sure that we're bringing value added, not just to you all, the individuals who come to us uh, to take advantage of our services, but to the communities that we represent and the communities that we serve and to the nation as a whole. 
which is not an easy thing to do at a time when there are increasing political and economic challenges that we must face. But these are all ways which is historically that have had to overcome challenges, and so there's no reason why we can't continue to take that perspective and continue to provide the kind of background and appropriate instruction for you that will serve you well so that you can be community leaders in the future. So this is where I think we're going. I think that your interest and your energy, your concern about your institution and the whole set of HBCUs is extraordinarily important, and I commend you for your interest and concern in that regard. Thank you, Dr. Hart. Please give him a round of applause. It's time for a break. We have two minutes for a break. Um, what I'll do at this point is introduce the rest of our local panelists, and then after the break, you'll come back with your opening statements. All right? On my right, we have, uh, this is Nalita, Nalita Holt. Uh, she is a Nalita Holt Blunt. She's a 2013 uh, upcoming graduate. And then we also have Mr. Carlton Brewer. He is also vice president. Oh, I'm sorry. That's my phone. That's my, my alert. I'm sorry. Excuse me. We also have Mr. Carlton Brewer. He is the vice president of the Student Government Association, followed by Mr. Obum Nwankwo. He is president of the Student Government Association, followed by Ms. Trina Fletcher, who is a 2009 graduate of the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. Please give our panelists a round of applause. It's time for a break. And we're back. Welcome back to National HBCU Week Assembly at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. My name is Tisha Arnold. I am serving as the moderator for this panel. And we, we've already been introduced. Uh, Dr. Harvey's already, already introduced himself. We will now move down our table, starting with Ms. Holt Blunt. Good morning, you all. My name is Nalita Holt Blunt. I am currently a senior here at this university, majoring in biology. I graduated in May 2013. Wow. And I just thank you all for giving me the opportunity to serve on this. Um, good morning once again. I'm Carlton Brewer, Vice President of the Civil Government Association. Uh, it is an honor to serve here on this panel. I guess being one of the younger panelists is I graduated in 2014. I'm a junior major in political science. I'm from Ohio. Thank you. Um, good morning, you all. It's an honor to be here. My name is Lord Walker, the SJA president. I'm 20 years old. And my major is in social technology. And it feels good to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Trina Fletcher. I'm actually a 2008 graduate. Oh, um, I majored in industrial tech also, and um, I'm very happy to be back. I actually try to get back to UAPB every year and speak to the students about the importance of internships, et cetera. But I think this particular topic is extremely important, and uh, I want to thank you guys for inviting me, and I'm looking forward to answering some of the questions. Thank you. Please give our panelists another round of applause. While HBCUs represent only 3% of all colleges and universities, they enroll close to one-third of all black students. 40% of HBCU students pursue four-year degrees in science, technology, engineering, and math. And about half of all black students in teaching fields attended HBCUs. Three-quarters of all African Americans uh, that have PhDs graduated also from HBCU. Our first question, though, is, is an HBCU education different? And if so, can you name three ways? Do you want to start? Who would like to start? Dr. Harvey, would you like to give your insight on that? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, my perspective is probably a little bit different than most of you folks on the panel because I have had significant experience in predominantly white institutions. I've worked in several, including North Carolina State here, uh, in the state of North Carolina at the University of Virginia. And uh, so I had the chance to observe the students in those settings, and I think I can say with some degree of authority that uh, there is a significant difference in the cultural support that institutions uh, provide when they are HBCUs to African American students than when those institutions are probably right. I think the legacy and the tradition of these institutions is one that uh, challenges and provides students an opportunity to live up to their maximum potential. That's not always the culture in DWIs. And I think that's an important element that uh, continues to distinguish the HBCUs from predominantly white institutions. 
I would hope that uh, by attending an HBCU, um, students uh, reaffirm a commitment to our history, to our culture, and to our traditions. We uh, recognize that uh, our circumstances in this country have often been very difficult. We've overcome those difficulties, and these are institutions that uh, kind of preserve and extend that legacy of accomplishment. And I think coming to an institution like Pine Bluff or Wyoming, North Carolina AHU, or any HBCU gives the student a chance to recognize the significance of that historical legacy and extending it into the future. And that's the third difference that I would think is uh, the one that's obvious between the HBCUs and PWIs. Students on this panel and students in the audience get a chance to connect to individuals like themselves who are going to be leaders of our communities in the future. This is an incredibly important set of relationships that are going to make a difference not only in their own lives, but in the difference of lives of individuals in the communities that they're going to affect as they go forward after graduation. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes, I think that um, HBCU uh, education are extremely unique in that they offer a student um, a rich culture, heritage, and academia with a sense of belonging. Um, HBCUs were founded with the um, purpose of giving African Americans a chance at higher education, and they continue to do so, uh, giving us African Americans, uh, they graduate us, make us competitive individuals, and in not only in the corporate world, but also in research and academic uh, capacity. Piggyback on what my colleague just said, uh, there is a difference. Uh, this summer I had the opportunity to uh, intern at a PWI, and when I say that I excelled in ways that I could not imagine because I came to HBCU, I understand how to talk to a professor, I understand that I can go to a professor one-on-one -on -one and talk to them about the grade and ask them how can I better myself at the course uh, when some of my uh, Caucasian colleagues were scared to talk to, to that professor. I explained to them that I went to HBCU, and in my institution, we are able to go to the, uh, the professor and talk to them about how can I continue to excel in your class. So yeah, there is a difference, and I believe that HBCUs are better than PWIs in many ways. <laughs> Those things are very key. And prime examples, I have a twin sister, and we went to different undergraduate universities. She went to the University of Arkansas, and I came to UAPB. And we both went off to grad school, and you know, she went to Harvard, and I went to George Washington University. And we used to sit back and talk about our different experiences, and she always noticed how much more comfortable I was with communicating about what was going on and the issues I had to face, you know, to what they were saying. You know, I had one-on-ones with Dr. Benjamin. I had a chance to talk to uh, Chancellor Davis when I was in undergrad, whereas my sister never had an opportunity to meet her chancellor or even sometimes the dean of her school. So those are the things that I want to encourage you guys to take advantage of here at an HBCU because it's not always available at other institutions. So a lot of students think they're missing out on things at other schools, but the grass, the grass is not always green on the other side, and that's a perfect example. Thank you. I did a little bit of preliminary research on a lot of blogs and websites about why attending it, why should you even attend an HBCU? One of the contentions was, uh, some contend that students miss the racial diversity experience while attending an HBCU. Give me your insight on that statement. That usually, we're, because we're around primarily African Americans all the time, that we miss that cultural exchange of being around someone from a different background. Go ahead. Well, I don't know if uh, we just took a look around campus, but I have I really feel that it's diverse. Yeah, I've been from Canada. I met a girl the other day from Peru. And I don't, the eyes of me going to Peru are very slim. So 
when I talk to her about her prayers and her culture and her religion and all this, I was culturally shocked. I was like, well, maybe I can plan a trip to come to your hometown and understand <laughs> what's going on over there. So I believe that it is diverse. Uh, yep. Any other? I believe so, too. I mean, coming to this young girl, she's looking at them from the outside in. You would think that... Yeah, this this campus is a majority of African Americans, but if, when you start walking around campus, you look in your classrooms, you you greet your teachers, you sometimes feel like I feel like this is sometimes students' first opportunity to actually experience uh, ethnic differences amongst themselves. I mean, then you also have to look at the fact that rural South is very diverse. You know, I'm from a predominantly white town. So when I came to UABB, I was like, whoa, you know, like, <laughs> I've never been around this African-American. So it gave me an opportunity to really learn more about my African-American side. Like I said, with, in my sister's case, that wasn't the case because the black population of U of A is very small. Mm -hmm. So there were times when she would come down here to homecoming, and she would feel like an outcast and, you know, not really know how to, how to um, kind of, you know, pick up on everything. But, yeah, you, and then also look at our professors. We have... Mm -hmm professors and, and teachers and instructors from different areas and even some of our leadership members. So um, diversity is, is, a, is a very unique thing. You know, it's, it's a lot bigger than what we think. So um, we just try to think outside the box in that case. And I think that to sum it up, the statement could be, we're historically black, but we're not all black. Yeah. Three minutes to break, okay. Um, I saw this statement online uh, that talked about uh, some of the diversity of which you were talking about, uh, Trina, when they were talking about the, the faculty. If you look at our faculty, we have one of the most diverse faculty um, in this state. We have people from Africa, from uh, Israel, from um, India. We have people from just about any part of the, of the, uh, the entire globe. So I don't, I don't think that that statement is necessarily true. So we talk, go ahead, sure. About that, if I can, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, I think it's a very important issue that you're focusing on there because the fact that you have a diverse faculty mm -hmm. is really what distinguishes many HBCUs from predominantly white institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, even after you go to Arkansas, or the University of North Carolina and our state, even though there may be 8 to 10 African American students, finding African American faculty at a predominantly white institution is a rare. So I think when we talk about diversity, we can talk about it in all its dimensions. Obviously, we want to make sure that you have some engagement and some interaction with individuals from different races. So, but it's extremely important for you to see individuals in positions of significance and prominence, and those would be university faculty members who look like you, understand your culture, your history, your tradition, and you're certainly much more likely to have that experience at an HBCU than you are for Donald White Absolutely. So let's transition to a little more serious question. Uh, oh, we have one minute till break. All righty. Um, it's not, it wasn't on this list, but I had a question about how do you think the perception of HBCUs have changed? And we'll just, we'll have to do some quick answers because we have about one minute till break. Um, anyone? Since we're talking about the diversity issue, that's a perception issue. People think because we're historically black, we're probably all black, but that, that's, that's not the case at all. So how do you think that perception has changed and, or, or has it changed? I think the perception has changed because I believe most people would have thought that I've done some research and it shows that HBCUs have a low rate of alcohol and drug abuse at their school. And I believe that some people normally think that as African American, it's probably that what we do is drink, smoke, and things of such nature. But we had the lowest rate actually as I've done some research. So it was a shock. It was a shock to me. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We're uh, we have a break. Okay, we have a two-minute break. Thank you all for your, your input thus far. Thank you. We don't win unless we work together. It's how we play our best. It's how we survive on the field. Now that same teamwork can save 13 million people affected by the famine, war, and drought in the Horn of Africa. Go to this site and forward the facts to everyone you know. The more people who know, the more money we can raise. And the more money we raise, the more people we can help. Because saving lives doesn't take a lot. It just takes a lot of us. Welcome back to the National HBCU Week Assembly at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. We are in our panel discussion discussing the ways that we can remain relevant for the next generation. We're going to move on to a question about the challenges that HBCU, HBCUs face. So what challenges do you think HBCUs face for this next generation? I 
think that they um, today uh, HBCUs face uh, low enrollment rates, uh, lowering graduate uh, graduation rates, and financial instability. Um, Go ahead. No, I mean, I think, I think what she said about the financial piece is very key. I know each year that I come back, when I go to some of the ceremonies or events, it seems like the amount of recent graduates that are donating, that are giving back, is getting smaller and smaller. And I know um, that's one of the reasons why I want to start a book scholarship. It's not something major, but it's something. Right. We've got to make sure that the, the students that are coming out now, we've got to be giving back. Um, we've kind of lost our touch as far as why this university started, how, you know, what people went through to start it. So we're kind of losing that and going off and doing all the things. We've got to make sure we're giving back, whether it's our time, mentoring, money. We have got to make sure we're giving back. And that's where we're struggling as far as HBCUs go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dr. Harvey, do you have any input on that? Yeah, that, that's just an incredibly important point. And um, it's one that we are trying to wrap our arms around here at this institution. Because I think, honestly, most HBCUs are. We have a situation where the funding considerations, particularly for public institutions now, is very dire because uh, almost all the states are in situations where they are cutting back. We know that historically the institutions have not been funded at the levels that they should. So when you take an underfunded institution historically and then you cut back on the level of financing, you put it in a very difficult situation. Now the uh, assistance that we need from our friends and particularly from our alumni is uh, at, at a point that cannot be stressed too often. Um, the, the, the notion of giving uh, one's own um, wealth or resources um, to institutions is generally referred to as planning. And we have a very interesting dynamic because people think that there are significant differences in terms of the way that philanthropy occurs in the white community as opposed to the African American community. Actually, the percentages are almost the same. White Americans give a, a particular percentage of their income that's relatively indistinguishable from what Af African Americans give to various causes and so forth. The difference is in where the money goes. White alumni are much more likely to contribute to their independent. African Americans, while they give the same percentage of their income, the greater bulk of that gift goes to their religious institution rather than to their education institution. Mm -hmm. So this is a process that I think almost all of us are familiar with. This is a process called tithe. Okay? So for many of us, we presume that a certain percentage of our income is going to go to our, our church, our religious denomination on a regular basis. I just finished writing a piece for our own school newsletter in which I challenged our alumni to think in a different way, and I coined the phrase for that topic, which I call pride, P-R-I-D-I-N-G. The same concept of, as tithing, give regularly to the institution that help you to get your educational foundation in the same way that you do to your church, your religious organization. And we really have to have that level of give back, that level of support to help us offset some of the cuts that we are receiving and to enable us to financially support some of the new initiatives that want to Thank you. Next question. Since we talk about some of the challenges, what are the opportunities for HBCUs for this next generation? We talk about remaining relevant. So where, where does the opportunity lie, in your opinion? Uh, sure. Uh, there are so many interns and fellowships and programs and, and conferences that, H, that are offered just for HBCU students. Because you go to HBCU, you have, you're kind of like at the, top of, at the top of the pool. Because people look down on HBCU, so they're like, OK, I want to see what this guy can do. I think I got my intern because they, they said that they had never had somebody from HBCU from Arkansas. So when I got there, I shocked them. And they said they're going to intern me now. They're going to get more people from here to come for their interns for the next so high years. So because I go to HBCU, there are so many opportunities for interns. Might as well you go to a, a, P, a PWI, really. Mm -hmm. And um, there's not so many interns. Thank you, Carlton, for representing UAPB. Give him a hand for that. Good to be a later. Other comments? Also, like Harvey said, interns is a big base factor. Like for Nesby, um, STEM scholars, if you're a STEM scholar, you would like to go to Nesby, which is a, uh, for black engineers. And it's a big convention for you to try to get an internship. And it's so many, it's African Americans you see there. And it's just, it's 
like that's your opportunity to grab internships. Like there's no way you can go there and not get an internship pretty much. So I think it was a great opportunity to get, get out, see the world, and see what different companies out there, such as like Eden, TI, or just great major corporations. And they can give us a chance, and then we bring for your school, you bring back different corporations to your school to get more students. Okay. Yeah. I feel like um, the opportunities lie heavily in STEM uh, majors. Um, in career seeking of the fa uh, faculties, there is higher demand for people in STEM majors. They have the greatest potential for growth in uh, our society today. I think that's where the opportunity lies for us. Mm -hmm. Dr. Harvey, do you have anything? I think that um, the, um, first of all, the election of uh, people who are selected for your panel is, uh, I think, speaks very well for the institution and, and, and the way it was. They are providing, uh, I think, a very high level of analysis and understanding of the situation is very commendable. So I want to just make that observation first. Uh, there are some very significant opportunities for us as institutions and for the individuals within the institutions. And we were talking yesterday, Keisha, about the new PhD program that you all are about to put in place in regards it's, it's to in place. the fishing mm -hmm. industry. Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I think being innovative and being forward-looking is an important part of what we have to do as institutions. And then we have to encourage students, like these young people, to take advantage of these opportunities because there are a number of possible considerations out there, things that we didn't even anticipate as employment opportunities a few years ago. I think the STEM dimension is a very important one, and that's partly what our focus here is in North Carolina AT. But I think we also ought to be thinking in very, very broad terms um, for individuals who are majoring in things like political science, you know, their fields of law, politics, and government, and, and public service. Uh, in my own particular case, we are in dramatic need of more teachers in our school system, particularly male teachers. Okay? So there are significant opportunities across the landscape. And what I think our institutions have to do is be prescient enough to look at what those opportunities are going to be in the future and then make sure that the graduates are prepared to take advantage of those opportunities. The other thing we have to do is make sure that students take advantage of the culture that we talked about here to maximize the level of their personal and academic accomplishment so that when those opportunities present themselves, they're ready to take advantage of it. Thank you. Do you have some? All right, our next question, what would you say to someone to convince them to attend an HBCU? Anybody can start. I tell them that uh, where some universities tend to break you down uh, as an individual and build you back up in their image, our university tends to focus on you and your unique talent. They, they want to enhance your talents and mold you to show you how capable you are as an individual and what you have that other people, possibly employers, want. Thank you. Thanks. I mean, there are a lot of students that I mentor, that I've met, whether it's through you know, my job or when I was out in D.C. I would work at a local high school in Southeast D.C. And um, what I've realized through my experience is that for some of them, they trust me and they trust my opinion. I send them to an HBCU. It is what it is because I know that they're going to be taken care of when they get there. I've had other students that have gone to PWIs, gone into particularly STEM fields, and they did not make it. They ended up transferring, um, you know, or you know, whatever happened, financial reasons, et cetera. But um, I, I just, because of my experience, and it goes back to giving back and making sure you're sharing your story and your experience. Um, sometimes once you do that, students are going to know, like, okay, if I go to UAPB or I go to, you know. Um, just to say, I'm going to be taken care of. Okay. Well, basically, what I would tell them is, uh, you are your grades. No matter if you go to if you go to another school, if you go here, you are your grades. So, now once you go there, go to the HBCU and do what you need to do to get a diploma, get a 4.0, or even not a 4.0, 3.5 or 3.0. Period. You will make some out of yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, also, I will say the change that you will go through. You come in as a freshman, you, you're probably going to know what you're doing, but you will go through a great change, whether you become the SA president or Queens or vice president, or you may become a future instructor. There's a change that you will go through that people will notice about you 
and they will remember that, and that's gonna take you a far way. All right, thank you, Dr. Harvey. We have about one minute till break. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Can, can I say something? Sure. Because I think again, the, the, the comments that have made are very, very constructive and on point, uh, and, and they remind me of some statements that I've made recently to a group of students on our campus. We have a very unique situation here in North Carolina a and because we have a high school on our campus that is specifically for male students. The only all-male high school in the state of North Carolina operates on our campus. And so I had a chance to speak to the graduating class um, this past um, summer as they were leaving to go on to high school. 100% graduation rate, 100% college placement rate for that high school. Awesome. Okay. That's awesome. Congratulations. That's awesome. To these young men about the next step for them, I said to them, I think in some ways, but I hear from, from the young people on the panel, I told them that when they went off to college, there were two considerations that I wanted them to remember. One is that they got into college based on their aptitude, that they had already demonstrated that they have the academic capability to do well in the post secondary institution. But aptitude is not enough. There are a lot of bright students who don't do well when they get to college. The second consideration I wanted them to talk about is their attitude, okay? It's the perspective that you bring to the situation, your willingness to work hard, to sacrifice, to set your goals high, to understand that there are lots of people who work very hard to get you there, and that you have some responsibility to them and to your fellow students. And if you put that combination together, the attitude and the attitude, you take advantage of some of those experiences that the people on the panel talk about. You not only will have a tremendously satisfying personal experience, you will have an academic record and make you a very candidate for the employers that you're looking at. Thank you, Dr. Harvey. All right, we have uh, one last question, and then we, if there, are there any questions from the audience? Can you hear, is this good? Oh, we're on break, I'm sorry. How you doing? My name's Steve. My family's lived in this neighborhood for years. Recently, things got so tight, we had to go to our local food bank for help. I lost a lot of sleep worrying about what the neighbors might think. That is until I saw them there, too. How'd I do, Steve? A little stiff. You could have done a little what? better. What? Come on! You know, I have an Academy Award. Yeah, but not for playing me. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. And welcome back to the National HBCU Week Assembly at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. We're at the, the, the very tail end of our panel discussion. Uh, I didn't see any questions from the crowd, but I do have one last question. If you could tell somebody the best kept secret about HBCUs, what would that one thing be? Have I stopped the panel? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I will say that the pride that alums have for this institution or have for their HBCUs. When I was on my intern, me and another guy clapped and almost got into altercation because he was oh, talking no. about my HBCU. And I was talking about it was all funny games, but the pride we have for this institution is one of the best kept secrets. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mayors? Dr. Harvey, do you have anything? Yeah, I think uh, it, it's interesting again for me to, to hear from the people in the audience. I have two daughters. Uh, one is a Stoneman graduate, one is an Hampton graduate. Uh, and uh, I think the um, thing that I notice most about their involvement at those undergraduate institutions is the networking that occurred for them. They still are in very close touch with the individuals that uh, were in their respective classes, uh, and then you will see them on a regular basis by older girl went from um, from Stoneman to Johns Hopkins, where she got a PhD. Uh, my younger daughter went from Hampton to Tulane, where she got an MBA. And uh, they both were very, very well prepared at those institutions, undergraduate institutions, who went to graduate school. But apart from the academic experience, again, I think that for both of them, uh, we are continuously surprised at the uh, engagement and the communication and the interaction that they have with individuals who are members of their class. And I think that networking piece is part of, of kind of what escapes you when you're in it. But when you're looking at it from the outside, you realize how extensive it is, how ongoing uh, it is in terms of that connection over a number of years. Uh, these are uh, young women, for the most part, who encourage and support one another, who uh, provide information and assistance for people who are going through good times and bad. And uh, so I think that that's probably, from my 
standpoint, as a person who has kind of really, you know, had the experience, is one of the most important and valuable and probably overlooked aspects of the HBCU experience that goes on long after people have finished their undergraduate program and moved on to whatever station they might have. Well, that is the, I think, Everything that everyone has said is, was very informative. Give our panelists, please, another round of applause. I think in remaining relevant, this is not a discredit to predominantly white institutions. Instead, it's just helping us to know within ourselves, sometimes you have to talk to yourself so you understand there is a reason why we're here and why we must continue to be here, not just for African Americans, but for people overall. Regardless of your ethnicity, everybody needs that personal care. Everyone needs an opportunity to make an advancement for their, themselves personally. Everybody needs that diverse faculty. Everybody needs this human experience that we call a college education. I think as an institution, as an HBCU, we're challenged to continue to blaze our own trail, to make our own path, to continue to write our own story. And as the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, to continue our rich tradition and heritage and to make sure that we make sure our students have something that they can take away and become kind of brand evangelists for this institution so that they know regardless of where you came from, it's not about that, it's about where you're going. And we're here to help you give you that foundation. So thank you again to our panelists. Dr. Harvey, thank you for joining us remotely. Please give them another round of applause. It has been my pleasure to serve, I'm sorry? And thank you for organizing a very important and successful program. Thank you. First of all, I just wanna thank, thank you. I just want to thank Dr. Benjamin for her, her vision. Uh, about three years ago, I think that's correct, about three years ago, she uh, initiated us a challenge to start doing HBCU week activities. And we have grown, I can say, uh, tremendously uh, with the technology aspect because we have never done this before. And so this is new to us, and so I, I thank the committee. Uh, first of all, I want to recognize the committee. We have Dr. Uh, Nissa Buckner. There you <laughs> have. We, we have uh, Ms. Geneva Kelsey. Yes. Uh, and we have Ms. Tisha Arna. And for our student rep, uh, we have Mr. Justin Smith. And so we want to also thank our students uh, for coming out and, and, and spending this time with us. And also we wanna thank our panelists. We have on our panel, we have uh, Dr. William Harvey. We wanna thank Dr. Harvey. Uh, we have Ms. Trina Fletcher. Thank you. Uh, we have Ms. Mrs. Nalita Blunt. Mr. Carlton Brewer. And, and Mr. Obumiye Nwanko. Uh, we also want to thank uh, Chancellor Johnson uh, for being here uh, and supporting uh, our efforts. Uh, without uh, his presence, we, we, we probably wouldn't be where we are, so we want to thank him for that as well. Man, oh yeah. And we want to thank the, uh, the faculty.